Hello and welcome to Gold and Silver Assets. It's Sunday the 3rd of May 2020. So one recurring theme that I've noticed popping up in the comments section over the recent weeks is how the price charts are useless because the prices that were given are false, markets are manipulated, and so the real price of gold should actually be much higher than it is. And this got me thinking about gold, not only in terms of its price, but also its value. And these are two very different things. The price that we're all used to hearing about is the spot price. And that's what's used to create the charts that we use in market analysis. Now, the theoretical definition of spot price is the price of gold for immediate delivery. However, in reality, the spot price doesn't really reflect the supply and demand of the physical metal, as it's actually derived from the paper markets where only a fraction of contracts actually stand for delivery. And so some commentators have criticised the use of spot price, saying that actually the physical prices should be used instead to reflect the true price of the metal. So that sounds very sensible and straightforward in theory, but in practice it's not so simple. There is demand for the physical metal from both retail and commercial entities, and uh, these entities legitimately manage their risk by hedging using futures contracts. And the problem is that speculation and arbitrage are also trading activities that occur in these paper markets. And so it's very difficult to uh, disentangle these. If we were to just consider uh, the retail physical prices, then the problem is that we're looking at premiums that vary according to a whole range of factors. So, for example, different dealers may have different premiums, so it's definitely worth shopping around when you're looking for physical metals. They also vary by country and demand. So, uh, as little as six months ago, I remember that the US Mint had record low sales. They were sit sitting there killing flies at the time, whereas at the same time, the Perth Mint had very, very high demand for their products. And so, of course, the premiums would have varied between those two countries, depending on those factors. Premiums also vary depending on what form the gold that, uh, that you're buying. So, for example, cast bars tend to have a much lower premium compared to minted coins. And then, of course, it depends on the volumes that you're buying. So discounts are applicable to volumes. The other factors include things like taxation. So, for example, in the UK, there's a 20% value added tax, which is a form of goods and service tax when purchasing silver bullion. And when, interestingly, when selling gold bullion, one of the rare things that are free of capital gains tax in the UK are, are the gold Britannia coins. So as a result of all these factors, I think it's pretty impossible to actually produce a reliable chart that applies to everyone who listens to this show if we're looking at basing things on physical price. So in terms of charting, spot price and futures prices are really the only things we can rely on. But remember that the price of gold also varies according to what currency you're talking about. So the standard is to look at the price of gold in US dollars. However, when gold is priced in other currencies, the charts look quite different. We know that currently gold is trading at near all time highs in most currencies around the world. Whereas in contrast, US dollar priced gold remains below its all time high. And this is just a reflection of the relative strength of US dollars compared to other fiat currencies. So in the example shown here, gold is priced in three different currencies, and I've charted them in terms of change in price, in, term, in terms of percentage change. So the bars represent gold priced in US dollars. The red line shows gold priced in Turkish lira terms, and you can see that this has risen significantly. And this is purely a reflection of weakness of the lira relative to US dollars. In contrast, the orange line shown here is 
gold priced in Bitcoin. And you can see that this is actually dropping. And this suggests strength of Bitcoin relative to fiat currencies. But all of this is still based on the spot price of gold and therefore values gold in terms of fiat currencies. Is this the correct way of valuing gold, though? Another way to value gold is to look at its purchasing power. We know from charts like this that the purchasing power of the US dollar has dropped over 90% since the early 1900s. But looking at charts like this can be a little bit abstract. So let's look at some potential practical examples to try and assess the purchasing power of gold. Let's look at petrol, otherwise known as gasoline. In 1918, uh, the price of a gallon of petrol cost 25 cents. In 2019, the average price of petrol in USA was around $2.50. Now, I don't live in the USA, so I, I don't know the exact figure, but um, I just kind of derived this from the internet. Um, so if you look at this, basically, in 2019, if you still had that 25 cents, that would buy you one tenth, oops, sorry, one tenth of a gallon of petrol. So saving that quarter over a long period of time resulted in a significant loss of purchasing power. But then let's take another look at that quarter. So at that time, a quarter weighed 6.25 grams and consisted of 90% silver. So if you sold the quarter based on its silver value, not on its face value, then let's assume, for argument's sake, a uh, price per ounce of silver of, say, $14, then the quarter would be worth $2.62. That would be enough to buy you a gallon of petrol. So the silver retained its purchasing power over a period of 100 years. But it's not as simple as that also. What if that 25 cents had been invested in stocks? I use one of those online investment calculators to work out how such an investment would have turned out. So if invested in the Dow Jones, that had a, an average 6% annualised rate of return. And so that 25 cents would now be worth $87. Now, although this would have been subject to taxation, it's pretty clear that that's worth much more than the silver price. And so on the face of it, it looks like Investing in the stock market more than made up for any loss in the purchasing power of the US dollar. But I'll come to that point a little bit later. But let's have another look at that quarter that we were talking about. Have we actually valued it correctly? So I had a look on eBay to see how much 1918 US uh, quarters were going for. And I found that... In terms of the buy now price, the prices ranged anywhere from $30 and there was even one available for $8,000 US dollars. And this is all because of the numismatic value and that depends on various factors relating to the coin. So this really il illustrates how there are multiple ways of valuing things. Another common quote regarding the purchasing power of precious metals is how one ounce of gold buys a decent suit and that this has been true throughout history. So in Roman times, an ounce of gold bought a very nice handmade toga, such as the one shown here. But a modern day comparison isn't actually quite so simple. Uh, I had a look on the internet and you can see here that this suit can be bought from Walmart for as little as 60 US dollars. So thanks to the advances in technology, efficiency and economies of scale, 
Clothing can be made at much cheaper prices than they were in Roman times. So does that mean that the purchasing power of gold has actually increased? You could buy multiple suits like this for an ounce of gold. But having said that, you can actually spend a five figure number on a bespoke tailored designer suit used making the best materials and all handmade. So that's a huge range in prices there. This large range makes it difficult for us to estimate the value of an ounce of gold. So rather than using a single product to estimate the value of gold, another way would be to look at the wholesale price index, which has been used to determine the purchasing power. So this is a really interesting chart that I came across, which spans from the 1500s to 2015. And this is all British data and hence the very long history. All the units along this side are indexed to 100 at the 1930 time point over here. So this blue line here represents the price of gold and you can see that it's remained relatively flat up until the early 1900s and that's because uh, Britain was on a gold standard for this time. The green line represents the wholesale price index in terms of pound sterling and this red line is the difference between those two values. And so that red line is what gives us the purchasing power of gold. So for all these centuries, there was not a lot of fluctuation in the gold's purchasing power. However, also we can note that because the British pound was tied to gold for most of this period, we can see that the wholesale price index was also reasonably stable. The interesting part of this chart is what's happened over the last 100 years. Over this time, we've seen the step-by-step -step decoupling of the British pound from gold. And two things have happened as a result of this. First of all, you can see that the wholesale price index has risen constantly and significantly over that time. The other thing is that the purchasing power of gold has become a lot more volatile with much larger swings in purchasing power. Overall though, it's interesting to note that we're getting higher highs and higher lows. So this is effectively trending upwards. The reason for these fluctuations, my th initial thoughts are that they relate to the inflation deflation cycles that occur in the early to middle part of the fiat monetary system. And so this is just really an illustration that gold behaves quite differently depending on the type of monetary system we're working with. So that got me thinking, what would the chart look like in the case of a hyperinflating currency? And of course, a good modern day example of that would be Venezuela. So I tried looking for such a chart and it turns out it's quite difficult to get reliable data during hyperinflation. So I therefore tried to cobble together data from various different sources and indexed everything to 100 at the 2007 time point. And the last time point that I could find for all the data that I looked at was January 2019. So in terms of the wholesale price index, that came to 3.8 million. If we look at the Venezuelan stock market, I think you'll agree that the stock chart looks pretty impressive. However, the index number is 1 million. And so although it may seem like investors made money, the currency inflation meant that the stock returns didn't keep up with the wholesale price index. Stock investors have therefore lost purchasing power. And so these rises in the stock market were just an illusion. If we look at the price of gold priced in bolivars, then the index number actually came to 16.1 million. So this shows that not only did gold preserve 
the wealth, but it actually increased the purchasing power significantly. Now, I don't believe that high gold prices are something to get particularly excited about. A lot of people have all this hype about $10,000 US gold coming in the future, but I see that as a worrying sign. If we've got such high gold prices, that comes with its costs. And we can see that in Venezuela. And those costs will be poverty and social unrest. So don't look forward to it too much. So to put all this together, this tells me that gold behaves differently depending on the setup of the monetary system. So under the gold standard, the purchasing power of gold remains relatively stable. So here we've uh, got a stable purchasing power. However, in a fiat system, particularly in the early to middle stages where we have inflation deflation cycles, the purchasing power of gold fluctuates up and down. This means that there are certain times that are better than others for purchasing these precious metals. But in general, it does continue to preserve the purchasing power due to that upwards trend. But it's really in the final stages of the fiat monetary system that gold really comes into its own. Not only does it preserve wealth, but it also increases purchasing power substantially. So I think that it, it is these inflation deflation cycles that has led many to misunderstand gold. So even now, many people try to directly compare gold to other assets such as stocks. But the thing is, gold's function isn't to allow you to make a quick buck. It's not really meant as a speculative tool. It's survived for thousands of years as a store of wealth and has been successful at that function for that duration of time. And so I see its function as insurance against inflation and hyperinflation, as well as wealth preservation. So there are some people that might say, oh, the US dollar is not going to hyperinflate in my lifetime, so I don't need to own gold. Yet it's those same people that willingly pay insurance premiums for their whole life for events that may never occur. And the reason that they do this is that if such an event does occur, resulting in disastrous losses, the insurance can come through and save the day. I therefore believe that the value of gold lies in its properties that allow you to preserve wealth and provide an insurance against fiat inflation and hyperinflation. OK, so let's move on to looking at the markets and we'll start with the S&P 500 on the daily scale. So I saw this picture of lemmings falling off a cliff and it reminded me a little bit of how this chart looks. Uh, I actually think that this rise will have a lot of retail bag holders and unfortunately it looks like they're about to fall off a cliff. And to me, this chart signifies a tragedy for the everyday person. Last time we drew this ascending wedge and I talked about how I thought that the wedge had broken out to the downside and may go up and retest that. But I didn't think that it would exceed this previous high. And I actually said I thought that would invalidate the wedge. But looking at it, the lower edge of that wedge has actually served as resistance and it hasn't overcome it. And, uh, and then it now looks like it's turning downwards. But another possibility is maybe I was premature in drawing this lower line. One thing that I've noticed is that chart patterns are very, very easy to discern in retrospect. But the trick is to try and work out what's going on as the patterns are forming. And often there are multiple possibilities. So in this case, if in fact the, the bottom of the wedge was like this, then we may have just seen the breakout on Friday. 
If that's the case, there are two possibilities again. So price may turn back up to retest the bottom of that line. I wouldn't expect it to go above 3000 though if, if this wedge pattern is correct. But I think looking at it, the higher probability move is to the downside. And I think it's not going to be a mild drop. I think it's going to be a massive drop. So brace yourself. Moving on to gold priced in US dollars on the monthly scale. And we can see that gold remains in a very nice strong uptrend with higher highs and higher lows. We were expecting price to get entangled, and that's due to this price action that we saw back in 2012 and 2013. However, gold is performing pretty well, and it's actually broken out from this long-standing channel that we drew months ago. So we've got a nice green candle that seems to be staying above this channel. The resistance above is 1800. But it also looks like there's a reasonable amount of support here at around the 1530 US dollar kind of level. So let's look a little bit more closely at gold in US dollars on the daily scale. And as we've spoken of previously, multiple markets are showing this ascending wedge, which is a bearish pattern. And we did talk about how price uh, would break down from this level and then go up and retest that lower wedge line before turning back downwards. And it does seem to be doing that. The question is, will this upper channel line that we saw in the previous chart serve as sufficient support to stop any further declines? And so what we're looking for is a drop below the 1650 US dollar level, in which case uh, price would decline. And I would expect a drop to the mid channel area, which is around the 1530 US dollar level. And another area of good support is 1475 US dollars. But I think looking at things, the decline in gold should not really be as severe as the decline that I'm expecting in the stock market. But let's see. Moving on to silver priced in US dollars on the monthly scale. And as you'll recall from previous video videos, we had joined the previous highs to produce this trend line. We then cloned that line and joined it to these two previous lows. And that enabled us to predict the low over here before it actually happened. So what's going on now? Well, let's zoom in and look at silver and US dollars on the daily scale. And what happened was that price bounced off that lower channel line quite strongly, in fact. But again, as we've seen in other markets, formed this ascending wedge. Price has broken down from that wedge and hasn't retested it. And it has found support on this long standing red trend line that dates back for about 20 years. I'm wondering, based on what I'm seeing in all the other markets, whether this trend line is going to hold. I actually think it might well break and we are likely to get a drop down back to the lower channel line. So we're looking at the, around the $11.60 level. But I don't think it's going to hang around there long. I would be very surprised if it broke down below then that level but you know nothing's impossible in the markets what i suspect will happen here is that we may get a either a strong bounce back up or a bottoming formation before moving back up and that would be a great setup because that would mean that we could have a double bottom and that would propel the silver price back up to the 19 dollar level and the crucial level we're looking for for a for an upwards breakout in silver is above this upper channel line. And what's going on with the gold silver ratio? So here we have it on the daily scale. And again, if you look at my previous videos, we had drawn this ch these channel lines and we've got this upper resistance line here, which is just below the 128 level. And what's been happening here is that 
I wonder, it's still early days, but is this an inverted head and shoulders pattern? We do have quite a sloping neckline, so I would want to see a close, let's say above 115 um, before considering to this to be complete. So remember that I said that, that while patterns are forming, you, you've got to think of what alternatives are going on. Another possibility is that we're having a kind of elongated triangle formation, in which case that could break out in either direction. So let's keep a watch on this. But if this is the inverted head and shoulders that I'm thinking of, that would bring this ratio back up to this mid 120 ratio level. I think that that upper channel line is likely to provide resistance. And then at that point, I would suspect the ratio to turn back down again. But let's see what's happened, what's going to happen. It will be interesting. And finally, let's move on to looking at the miners. So this is the GDX on the monthly scale. And if you remember a few weeks ago, I was talking about how I thought that price had been moving for the past few years within this horizontal channel line. And when prices were around this kind of level down here, um, I had talked about how I thought this was possibly a double top and was expecting the GDX to drop down to this bottom channel line. Interestingly, it did drop, but it fell short of that lower channel line and actually it rebounded a lot more strongly than I was expecting. And in fact, it broke through that overhead resistance level that had been long standing for many years now. But I've had another look at this and based on that recent low, I wonder if we've got an upsloping channel. So I've drawn that as a possible alternative. It's still early days to say, but the interesting thing that I found was that when I joined these two lows, cloned those lines and then joined it to this high, that actually turned out to meet the recent high in the GDX, which it bounced off of. Now, I don't know which of these uh, things is going to be correct. If it is the horizontal channel, then this is broken out because we've had a close kind of two, two months in a row um, above the channel line. And so if it is the channel, then we can expect continued upside and the target would be the same as the height of the channel. So we're looking at kind of around up here kind of level. But to me, it just seems a bit premature for that. I don't know. Um, let's see what happens, really. If it is the sloping channel that's correct, then I'm expecting prices to turn back again before continuing an upwards move. So let's zoom in on the GDX at the daily scale to see if we can get any clarity on where this is going. So again, we drew this wedge earlier on, but I'm wondering in this case, did I prematurely draw the upper li line on the wedge here? Maybe this is the correct line like this, in which case we have seen a downwards breakout, an upwards retest, and so in which case, if this is correct, then further downside could be expected. It's hard to say at the moment because we need to know how strong this upper channel line is in terms of a support level. If this remains support, then the channel thesis is in play. But if it breaks, then we're looking at that sloping channel instead. And in terms of downside targets, we're looking at around the 16 level here. So that go, takes us back to the bottom of the wedge, but also to the bottom of that upsloping channel. The other thing that I found interesting, which also makes me think we're looking at more downside, is that the volumes have been decreasing. If we were to expect that this was a significant breakout, particularly since this line has served as resistance for over seven years, I'd have expected a high volume 
to occur in this. And I would have also expected to see much stronger candles than we've seen. If you remember last week, I was talking about how these candles were looking somewhat weak. So lots of interesting things going on in the markets. Well, that was quite a marathon video for me. Um, I hope it made sense. Talking about value can be a little bit mind bending. But if you found that it was helpful, hit me up with a like and if you haven't been here before, subscribe below if you like what you saw. See you next week. Bye.